Welcome to the podcast, as advertised on Facebook, on Lim Tien's Facebook account, between Leong Zhe Hien, welcome. Hi, hello everybody. And between Lim Tien. Hi. Hi everyone. Here we are having this uh, podcast about the legal case um, that has hit Singapore, really. Singapore opened up to 2019 with this, this big event, which you two are both very much part of. Um, and what the idea of this podcast is, is to really spell out Firstly, the timeline of events. I think people are a bit confused about that. Um, and then later from Lim Tien about the legal implications and what's actually going on in the case. We also, Lim Tien on your Facebook asked for viewers to write in and they did. So there's several questions here to ask from the public. So uh, we'll do that a bit later. So we'll start with the, the, the timeline first, okay? So, um, Zhe Hien, what happened? On the 7th of November in the evening, right. I saw a Facebook posting of a news article, the news report from a Malaysia uh, news website called thecoverage.my uh, about uh, Singapore's involvement in the 1MDB. And so I shared it on my Facebook. Uh, without any comment that is on the, in the evening of the 7th of november uh, three days later uh, the imdb the infocom media development authority sent me an email on the 10th of november at about 11 30 pm uh, asking that i take down my facebook chat post within six hours I only saw this when I woke up in the morning the next day on the 10th of November about 7.30 in the morning. So I deleted it mm -hmm. and informed the IMDB that I have deleted the post. Uh, two days later, on the 12th of November, uh, when I was not at home, a letter of demand was delivered to my house uh, suing me for defamation. Okay, so it was up. The post was up for about three days. Um, yeah, about three days. Yes. Before they notified you, Lim Tian, is that normal to have this short period of like when you get notified something legally, to take something down or to respond in some way that's if you don't, you know, you're going to be in legal hot water. Uh, what do you have to say about that? Well, as I understand the facts, uh, Zhi Hian put up or shared the post on the evening of the 7th of November. I think the timing was around 6.30 or, or thereabouts. Um, I stand corrected, but I think it was thereabouts. And then on the 9th of November, I believe, at about 11.30 p.m. at night, IMDA emailed him uh, demanding that he take down the post within six hours. Now, two things come to my mind straight away. They must be a very hardworking lot at IMDA, still working at 11.30 p.m. at night. And as for your question as to whether it is normal for such a short period of time for the post to be taken down, I understand that that is their practice or it has become a practice, but certainly on the legal front, no, it is not normal for uh, a, a demand to be met within such a short period of time. But I think it has become the norm as far as demands from IMDA are concerned. Um, Zhehian, have you been in trouble before for defamation or anything like this in your entire life? No. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and you're 65, I'm okay to say that? Yeah. Yes, okay, uh, so this was my 65th birthday present <laughs> <laughs> in oh, November. Your, oh, your birthday's in November. Yes. So congratulations, happy birthday. And that was your, yeah, happy birthday from the Prime Minister. Now, Lim Tien, this is, a, this is directly from the Prime Minister, right? Because you cannot defame a, a group, is that correct? That is correct. I mean, this defamation uh, is, action has been launched by the Prime Minister. The plaintiff is the Prime Minister himself. So, uh, yes, it is a personal action, and defamation really is a tort 
under English and Singapore law for damage to one's reputation. Okay, what is tort? <laughs> for those of us that um, are not a lawyer like you or legally, what does tort mean it, when you say it's a tort? Um, in English law, there are various areas of the law such as contract, which everyone knows about. Uh, there, there are other areas like land law. Tort is a, um, a, a cause of action in English law and Singapore law since we follow British law. Uh, which has a lot to do with what is known as the duty of care, the neighbor principle. So as, as people, we are supposed to have a duty of care towards each other and we are supposed not to harm each other. So thought derives from that. Okay, thank you. Thank you for that little education. Um, and what about you? When did you come on board with this? How did you hear about it? What's your timeline on this? I didn't come into the picture until quite late. Because uh, initially, Zhe Hien uh, chose to represent himself. He even filed the memorandum of appearance uh, himself, meaning that he would uh, defend the action. If you don't file a memorandum of appearance, the plaintiff then can enter judgment in default of appearance against you. But Zhe Hien, to his credit, actually filed a memorandum of appearance himself. And it wasn't until quite close to Christmas time that I got involved in the case. Ah, if I may add to that. Yes, please. Yes. Uh, when I received the letter of demand on the 12th of November, uh, I thought it was maybe a mistake or something, since I had already uh, <laughs> deleted the post uh, as uh, required by IMD two mm -hmm. days earlier. Mm -hmm. And so I uh, was thinking maybe it's a case of the left hand doesn't know what the right hand is doing, yeah. <laughs> and so I just I just didn't do anything, you know. It was only on the four days later, on the sixteenth, when another letter came. Then I realized that this was this is for real, right? But uh, I was out of town for like the next couple of weeks, so uh, there wasn't much I could do. I also was in Singapore. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sometimes that happens, right? You know, you get a letter for, you know, for a bill. You've already paid the bill, but you still get another letter saying, hey, you owe this money. And, you know, yeah, like precisely. You say, That's why I thought, you know, uh, it was, I was surprised. <laughs> yeah, especially when you're dealing with the government offices, right? That, that's perfectly normal to think because we've all experienced that. So, okay, so that's with the timeline. Now, um, let's talk about the, the wider message here. So, Lim Tien, as a lawyer... What do, well, uh, you, you've got two things going on here, obviously. So you're a lawyer, but you're also involved in politics yourself. Um, why did you take this case? Um, I am a firm believer in the freedom of speech, in the freedom of expression. And I am a traditionalist in the sense that if a person with, uh, who needs representation in court comes to me, uh, to represent him, I will, if I am not engaged in another case. And uh, I think that is in the best tradition of the bar. And I have known Zhe Hien now for some time, you know, uh, for uh, at least two to three years. We are regular speakers at Hong Lim Park. And, um, you know, uh, I, I respect what he does. I, I, I follow his uh, blog uh, regularly, almost every day. So. I know what he, he, he writes. And so when he approached me to ask, he asked me to represent him, I had no hesitation. If I may say, uh, actually it was quite funny, when uh, uh, Terry Su, the chief editor of the Online Citizen, mm -hmm. asked me, uh, who is your legal counsel? <laughs> <laughs> and of course, I had uh, just returned to Singapore uh, on the 4th of December at 4.35 p.m., when the Straits Times published the news that the Prime Minister was suing me at 5 p.m. and that evening they pasted all the documents on my gate. Oh. So uh, when Terry asked me, I said, no, I don't have a, a legal counsel. And I quipped and said, uh, well, I think I have the best counsel, the people of Singapore. <laughs> but I must say now, uh, I have the best legal counsel, <laughs> Lim Tien. <laughs> Lim Tien is going to defend you. And there is this prospect, because it is against the Prime Minister as a man, as Lee Sin Lung, not as the office, um, that you could actually be face to face with him in court, asking him questions. That doesn't phase you at all, Lim Tien? 
Oh, not at all. Not at all. I mean, cross-examination is something I have done throughout my life. And, uh, you know, for, for those who are listening in on this program who may not know what cross-examination is, it, it literally means uh, being able to ask that person, the other side in court, you know, about the case. And, uh, of course, you have to ask relevant questions, but you can ask anything that is relevant. And uh, it has been often said that cross-examination is the single most effective device ever invented by man to discover the truth. Okay, so has this ever happened in the history of Singapore? Has the pr a Prime Minister of Singapore ever been cross-examined in court? Oh, yes. In fact, he has. Be in fact, um, you know, if we go back to history, the very first defamation case was launched by Lee Kuan Yew against J.B. J. Ratnam. And I believe that was in the late 70s. I still remember the great British counsel who came down for that case. It was Robert Alexander QC represented, representing Lee Kuan Yew and John Mortimer, the very famous author who represented J.B. J. Ratnam. So, yes, prime ministers have been cross-examined, and even Lee Hsien Loong himself has been cross-examined in court before. And I think the last time it was by Roy Nung, the blogger whom he sued, and who represented himself. So, there we go. <laughs> but has the prime minister of Singapore ever himself been sued? I understand that this is the first time a substantial action has been taken out against him. So... I think Zhu Hien is making history here in that this is the very first time a prime minister has been sued. I, I, I do understand that there might have been a previous occasion where someone took out a writ of, act, writ of summons against the prime minister, but you know, that was dismissed all right, uh, uh, without much protest because that was thought of as a nonsensical case, really. Okay, thanks for that. So we, we've jumped just ahead a bit. We're talking about the case, uh, but let's go back to the timeline. Um, and I forgot to ask you, and this is something that I know on Lim Tien's Facebook, a lot of people have asked, like, how wide, when you posted what you posted, and it was there for a total of two days, um, what was your reach? Like, how many people shared it? And, 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 and actually, one really important factor here is you shared the post without any comment. You didn't say... This is good, this is bad. Yes, nothing like at all. Nothing yeah. at all. You just yeah. shared it. It was yeah. like a lazy share. <laughs> um, but how many people shared it from your well, According to the letter of demand, yes. my post was shared uh, 18 times, 1-8. Oh, they're so keeping track. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so it's not really widespread. Lim Tian, does that have any implications in law? Like, you know, if you post something and two people read it, or you write it in a book and 20,000 people read it, does, does the quantity matter? Oh, very much so. It, it matters in the sense that damages uh, in defamation, in libel, is based on the reach, how many people have actually seen it. Or, um, uh, so here, I would argue that being shared 18 times is really minuscule. It is negligible. And which is why uh, we say in uh, Zhe Hien's defense, and there will be more coming up in, in the case on this uh, point, that really it is an abuse of the process of the court for the prime minister to be taking out this action. And it is totally out of proportion to what alleged harm to his reputation was caused. I also understand that uh, that particular post which I shared, the Malaysian news website's uh, news report, was shared uh, 9,000 over times. In other words, 9,000 more people shared that post and I'm one of them. <laughs> <laughs> so you're one of 9,000? Yes. But you're the only one being sued? I believe so, yes. I'm the only one. And they did ask the coverage to take... Can you, can you uh, tell us what happened with the, the coverage? They asked the, the government asked them to take down the post? Or? Yes, they asked the coverage.my to take down the article. They asked Facebook to take down the article. They asked the author of the original article from where 
the Malaysian website extracted most of the information. A Singaporean understand living in Australia, and all three of them, Facebook, my coverage dot my as well as the Singaporean living in Australia, all refused to take down the posting. Yes, uh, I I just want to add on to what Zihian said later. I believe uh, Roy Neng recently wrote a post uh, to suggest that nine thousand nine hundred and seven people actually shared the same article, but Zihian is the only one targeted and the only one being sued. 9,700, that's a lot. That's more than your Facebook page, Lim Tian, and you have quite a reach in so Singapore. So <laughs> maybe for once I should ask the question, why am I so special? <laughs> you are, it was your birthday, you got picked. <laughs> and that's really been the catalyst for this whole movement that's now sprung up around you. Because you've recently been in Hong Kong and you've had numerous media um, interviews and with Amnesty International. And of course, lots of people globally are looking at this and thinking, hey, this poor guy, <laughs> you know, he, he shared a Facebook post, he didn't comment on it, other people created it, other people shared it, and you're being sued by the Prime Minister of Singapore. I mean, before we go into the social impact of, of that and how it's got far reaching, uh, you know, across the globe, what is the, what, you know, we can only um, speculate here, but what is the Prime Minister of Singapore thinking? I mean, not as the Prime Minister, as the man, like what, what, what do you think this is about? Because I know myself, I've been on the Prime Minister's own Facebook page um, when he made his rally speech, which would have been, which month was that? August. August. And I was really shocked to see somebody had put a GIF. A GIF is three images that makes it look like a, a, a little movie. And it was the, the back end of, I can't remember, an elephant or a buffalo defecating, right? <laughs> and like that was that person's expression, right or wrong, of what they thought of the Prime Minister's speech. And that was still up the next day. So I was actually thinking, that's really good. Like they're allowing a lot more freedom of expression. I can only think that that's a good thing. And that's obviously such a, a silly schoolboy type of a post. Like let it go, you know. Um, but then, you know, fast forward several months and we hear this. This is, you know, obviously there is a, a clamp down, a stranglehold, a selective stranglehold. What do you think's going on? Do you think he's just having a really bad time and you're the, you're the straw that broke the camel's back? Like there's a lot of, I, and I read a lot of, say, they say dissenting, but you know, natural, honest expression of leaders, which I think is very, very useful. Do you think it's coming from him, like he's just like had enough? Or do you think this is a broader strategy or somewhere that Singapore is wading into now? Well, yeah. as um, I said in the statement put out by um, uh, my law firm Carson Law Chambers, and this is also pleaded in uh, Zihian's defense, that this action, the sole purpose, well, I would say one of the main purposes is to chill the freedom of expression ahead of what are likely to be general elections this year. And it is a sad fact that over the last half a year or so, civil liberties in Singapore have been severely curbed. And Zihian's case is just the latest one. And before that, you saw the prosecution of Terry Sue of the online citizen. You saw the contempt of court legislation being used on people like Jolivan Wham, on John Tan. So, and you know, when they introduced this legislation a couple of years ago, they said, oh no, we are just codifying what is the common law principles behind contempt of court. But no, they are being used now. And obviously it is to try and f warn people not to be critical of the government because they could face legal action. You have asked a really difficult question. I like to right? do that. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> how would I know uh, what's going on in his mind? Well, you're actually kind yeah. of the same age. How old is Lee Sen Long? He's uh, one year older than oh, I am, I understand. You yeah. right? So, you're like so he should be 66, mates. yeah. O okay. okay. <laughs> oh, yep. So Sorry. like I said, uh, it's a really difficult question. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe you should ask me a different question, like, uh, what's your hobby? What did you have for breakfast this morning, Zayn? <laughs> 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 I, I, I have not had breakfast. 
uh, for many days now. <laughs> oh. Yeah, actually, how has it been? So let's go back. You went to Hong Kong. You've got mm. all this, na- uh, you know, global interest from these other interests because this is. It's whilst it's not a test case in Singapore, right? This is they, they've, they've sued for defamation before. This is a test case globally. Um, I know other countries, but you know, like developing countries, emerging company, c- countries have tried to put a stranglehold on social media because it's it's very inconvenient when you're trying to tell one narrative and yet the, the social media is alive with the, the truth and, and other perspectives. But Singapore's not a developing nation. It's not an emerging uh, nation. It's definitely a first world nation, and using first, you know, British law, which is a, uh, you know, uh, established globally. So um, this is has wider impact, and there are definitely, you know, movements, NGOs, very interested in this case because um, it has far-reaching implications. Are we allowed to share, or are we not allowed to share? And Facebook itself has. It's kind of said, look, we're not interested in this, right? We, they have very robust community guidelines. You know, we all know that if you fall foul of those, they will pull the plug on your account. You didn't fall foul of any of those community guidelines. Um, so how has it been for you? Because now you're, you've become this spokesperson. And it's quite interesting because we think of social media as the young person's game. It's the millennials. It's the Gen Zs. And yet here you are, 65-year-old Zerhien, very learned. You have your degrees and you're a very you know, accomplished man. Never been in trouble before for defamation. And you find yourself on the top of this movement, the, the face of the, the you know the persona of this movement that has really far-reaching implications for especially for the younger people today. Like, how does that feel? Is that why you haven't had breakfast for several days in a row? <laughs> I've been I've, I've been very busy, <laughs> <laughs> you know, since I received this uh, 65th birthday present. But let me try to answer you uh, by telling a little joke. Many of my friends say, uh, "Oh, you know." You, sometimes your hobby can get you into big and serious trouble. <laughs> so, what's my hobby? Uh, for the last 20 years, my hobby is to analyze government statistics mm. and uh, to ask for transparency and accountability, basically asking questions. Uh, and everybody ha- knows that uh, I'm a very careful writer. I've never mentioned anyone by name. Uh, I followed uh, Lim Tian's Defamation 101 video <laughs> almost to the letter, even before it was created. I never mentioned anybody's name. I mentioned I never mentioned anybody's position. You know, I'm analyzing government statistics most of the time. I'm just asking questions. I'm 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 always saying uh, we or, or Singapore or Singaporeans or our or they. You know, and uh, still uh, after 20 years of writing thousands of articles, a uh, few hundred letters published in the newspaper forum pages, a uh, few hundred speeches and protests at Hong Lee Park and, 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 and elsewhere. I never, never got into any trouble at all. Right? So this is really a big surprise uh, for me. You know, That's my answer to your question. But you've been very happy to give interviews, say your site. So you, you're actually, uh, you're happy to take the mantle of, okay, you know what, I'm going to go the whole way with this. I'm not going to kowtow. I'm not going to, you know, say sorry and squirrel away. This is really important. I, it's free speech. Has, so you're a figures man. You're usually um, getting to the grips of the surpluses in Singapore, the billion dollar surpluses and all of that. Um, free speech is not usually your hobby um but you're quite happy now to take on that yeah you know what we we need that free speech i wouldn't say i'm happy <laughs> i would describe <laughs> you that thrust I'm, into I'm, it. I'm, I'm happy I'm, I'm just i'm just defending myself but uh based on what you said actually what makes me a little bit happy is that uh many more singaporeans and the people in the world are now uh looking at what I call the mother of all Singaporeans' problems. You see, you can write a few thousand articles, you know, 20 years. Uh, most people don't really bother what you say. Right? But now, arguably because of this, everyone is asking the questions that I've been asking all these years. Let me just cite one example. We are the only country in the world whereby the government does not spend any money on pensions, public housing, or healthcare from a cash flow perspective. Meaning, 
that that the inflows exceed the outflows every year. Mm -hmm. No, there's no other country like ours with this unique fiscal model. Mm -hmm. And so, therefore, it could be more convenient or easier for the government to curtail free speech and stop you saying thing inconvenient things like that, rather than actually address the problem of the healthcare spending or <laughs> you know the spending that you actually uh, spoke I about. I think you there. hit it right on the nail. <laughs> this is what makes me happiest because finally, I think I will get some response right. and some answers from the government yeah. because. You, for 20 years, asking, you know, uh, must be at least a few hundred times. Mm. No answer, no response, nothing. Mm. Absolute silence. Mm. And I, th I think, actually, go over to Lin Tian, because your political party, People's Voice, you advocate a lot for equality. There's a, l uh, there's a large inequality gap in Singapore. A lot of people outside of Singapore looking in just see this shiny city. Um, but actually there's a, you know, a, a lot of inequality and that's something you're very keen to address and you are sure that things like free speech will actually help the inequality gap. And uh, when you can freely speak about leadership, government, policies, the, the surpluses, the, the lack of spending on healthcare, which is a free speech issue, actually you're also moving into that inequality issue. So. Um, we've moved over from this specific legal case to this broad subject of free speech, inequality, and does free speech have a place to play if you're going to address inequality? Very much so. Uh, I hope this answer is not going to be too long, but I, I want to go into some details. We have a far-right government now. I will call them extreme far-right. M much more far right than the conservatives or the Republicans in America are. And they practice a brand of economics known as neoliberalism, which means that you favor the rich, you make them more successful in the hope that the riches that they create will trickle down to the rest of society. And we have been doing that now for almost 50 years. Lee Kuan Yew started as a socialist, by the time he ended his premiership, he was a far, ultra far right, I would say, economic thinker. And he predated even Margaret Thatcher and Ronald Reagan. Now, Singaporeans realize after 50 years of neoliberalism, they are no better off. They don't really own their own homes. They don't have retirement adequacy. The cost of living far outpaces what they earn. And the PAP talks all the time about globalization, but actually it is globalization that has driven inequality to such heights today. And Professor Tommy Koh, one of our most esteemed diplomats, recently said that Singapore is the second most unequal society in the world according to the UN index. And I do believe that freedom of speech goes a long way towards determining how creative and innovative a society is. And Lee Kuan Yew himself said it a few years before he died, when he told three Harvard academics, China will never be as creative as America because in China there is no freedom of expression unlike in America. And you just have to go out to everyday Singapore life today. You go to a coffee shop, and you see mothers and fathers telling their children, shh, don't speak so loudly. It's as if big brother is behind you watching and you'll get into trouble if you don't say the right things or you say the wrong things. That cannot be the basis and the foundation for a creative society. And Singapore ranks very, very poorly in the creative index in the world. You know, every year they talk up about how innovative we are. We are the sixth or seventh ranked most innovative country, but actually in terms of innovation output index, we are always in the bottom half. So, and if we are not innovative, I don't see how the lower strata of society, how the middle class are going to move up and reduce this inequality gap. And if I may add to what Lim Tian has said, now what, what what does all this mean for ordinary Singaporeans? You know, this, so many people have difficulty getting a job, getting a job with a decent pay, 
And the issue here is that the government is not transparent with our job statistics. Let me just cite one example. About 47% of the workforce is non-Singaporean. 47% wow. of the workforce about is non-Singaporean, meaning foreigners and uh, PRs, permanent residents. Okay? And I'm not even making a, any adjustment for the new citizens and the new PRs that are granted every year. Mm -hmm. Every year you see the job numbers. Oh, we have locals employment growth, 10,000, 20,000, but they don't break it down into Singaporeans and PRs. So the problem is, every year, on the average, the government is granting 30,000 new PRs and 20,000 new citizens. Well, that's good for GDP, right? <laughs> yeah. So when you do that, a non-Singaporean may automatically be reclassified as a local worker the moment they get their residency or their citizenship status. So let's say, as I cited earlier in the example, employment growth was 10,000. They are locals, Singaporeans and PRs. How many are really true blue, blonde Singaporeans? Mm. Nobody knows. No one knows. It's a secret. So therefore, free speech would be very inconvenient. <laughs> because if somebody did know, this, you know the, the, the information that the government doesn't want can be spread. Do you think it's information that they don't want spread, like hard facts and data, or is it people's opinion? Do they think that, you know, if I say someone's an idiot, that might catch on and go viral and everyone will call that person an idiot? Or What, what, do, you think they're, what do you think they're strangling here? I think the PAP now has basically lost the plot. They really have. And that is what I tell opposition supporters. There is a lot for us to be optimistic about. Unfortunately, many opposition supporters cannot see the, the fact that for the first time in 60 years, really, the opposition are winning the battle of ideas. And the only thing that the PAP have left now is fear. And they will always try to use fear to control the population and to win elections. And I would suggest that Zihian's case and a lot of other cases which predated Zihian's case follows the same trend of instilling fear in people. If we can break free of that fear, Singapore will change and Singapore will change for the better. I'm not a politician, so I wouldn't use Lim Tian's <laughs> words, lost the plot, you know. Yeah. But they are lost. Let me just cite you a classic example. Read today's news. In Parliament, they will review MediShield life caps more frequently. Instead of five years, they're going to review it every three years. But the caps remain. What does that mean? You get this big news of an elderly person that has a bill for four thousand over dollars, and Medishield Life pays him forty over dollars. And what is your response? We will review this every three years instead of five years. So, what are all the Singaporeans going to do from now until the next review? They're all going to pay uh, four thousand over dollars and just claim forty over dollars. It's, it's nonsensical. So I think I can use the words. They have really lost the plot. <laughs> yeah, you are. Yeah. <laughs> Zahian's on board now with that phrase, lost the plot. So you recently did Defamation 101, a very short video with a cartoon character um, trying to help that young, I'd say the cartoon character was young, um, in what they can say to express themselves. Um, you think the young people of Singapore are the way forward? Uh, that was obviously aimed towards young people, aimed towards, um, yeah, I would say a newer generation. You know, you've used a new format. I think you're the only politician really in Singapore doing that, trying to use other types of platforms and format digital media in order to reach. Was that a, a concerted effort to reach the young people? And what do you think the young people have to bring in free speech? And what can it benefit them? Yes. Um, 
I, I did that video with the help of a lot of people and with donations from many Singaporeans whom I'm very grateful to. I made it so simple that even a primary school kid, a six to seven year old child can understand. I didn't want it to be complicated and lay people have no time for legalese and all that. I wanted to just instill the basic ideas of what is permissible, what is impermissible. Um, and coming to this idea of free speech and, and using new methodology, yes, politics has changed. Politics has changed so dramatically all over the world in the last three to four years. But, you know, when you read our papers, when you read the state media, and you read what, um, you know, some, even some established politicians or pundits say, it's as if politics in Singapore has never moved at all for 50 years. That is not true. And you know what? I dare even wager that in the coming general elections, Singaporeans are in for a huge, huge surprise. And our hope always has to be the young people because they are the future. And I hope that my video, Zihian's courage in defending the action and in suing the Prime Minister will show the way forward for the young people that freedom of speech is something to be cherished and will improve our society. I, I agree. I mean, free speech. And there's several examples around the world. Any nation that tries to curtail free speech, they always end up, the, you know, it really is people versus government. And if you, 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 you can't restrict free speech, and in today's world with social media, and even if you want to get on the internet, if they block a site, you can easily, anyone can get a free proxy and just circumvent that and, and, and access whatever it is they want. And then they can't just access it, they can share it in like in a nanosecond, they can share it with their whole group. Unfortunately, Zahir, you only have 18 people who shared yours, but, <laughs> no, but you have people so connected on all these Instagram, Twitters, um, that they can share it just like that. So it's a losing battle, and it's a shame that some governments in the world, and I would say Singapore government is one of them, don't have any new ideas on how to harness for themselves social media. I mean, never before has it been easier for a government to get their message out. To uh, A small change that they make today for just one person can be shared by this evening to one million people. People don't tune in all at the same time for the news. You know, we don't have this collective watching um, but the other side is we have a far more niched targeted uh, medium for them to use but it seems like some governments and that mindset that and I would say old mindset and I don't mean old as an age it doesn't matter if, you know you can be 25 year old with a, a, an old mindset they don't want to harness it for and, and use that as a springboard into this new era they would rather restrict and indeed let's go back to the defamation these laws are how old? 400 years? The, the, yes, the I British. They're about 400 years old, and they came about during the time of King James, you know, during the, the Regency period in England. So you are going back to really Georgian times, you know, at the very beginning of, of the Georgian period. It's about 400 years old, and I think the, the, the first cases were tried in the 1600s. So the joke in town is uh, free speech in Singapore is not free. <laughs> it can be very costly. <laughs> well, you guys are about to find out how costly it might be. Um, now, Singapore's going to be having their 200-year-old birthday, right? The bicentennial, um, February the 19th. Yeah, yes. February the 19th. That's actually quite interesting. So that's when, obviously, Raffles, a British guy, came and decided that Singapore was a perfectly place for a port. Um, and now, at the same time as this bicentennial, which could be a celebration of... You've actually got this this issue that is about how, you know, England itself has updated its defamation laws, right? They're not using the same 400-year-old, uh, you know, which was actually probably written with a feather back then. <laughs> it wasn't even by Rose. You know, they've changed. <laughs> they, they, they've, they've updated theirs. But Singapore has refused to, and it must be a refusal, right? I mean, you have a very uh, robust judiciary, plenty of members in there. It's, it's well-funded. It's not that they don't have the time or the resources to change. It's definitely a will. It's a battle of will isn't it? Um, so whilst the UK has modernised and 
taking into account all these new mediums, Singapore refuses to do so. And that's actually quite ironic, don't you think, when we're here on this 200-year-old birthday of the, the founding of Singapore? Oh, very much so. I mean, um, uh, besides the defamation laws which have not been revised, all right, and we are still following the old English defamation laws when you know, the, the, the creator of them, uh, Mother England, has really moved forward. Uh, there's one other example I want to bring to your attention, and that is marital rape. For the last 10 years at least, the UN has been calling out Singapore for still allowing marital rape. I mean, England abolished marital uh, in, in the 90s, you know, al allowing you to rape your wife in, in 1993, I believe. And if you ask me, that is a no-brainer, whether you should allow it or you should not. It's crazy in our age that we still have this law that technically allows a man to rape a, his wife, all right? And, you know, it was funny last year, or earlier this year, I read Indrani Raja say, or was it Shanmugam? I can't, I can't remember now, one of them say, oh yes, we are putting up a panel to review this thing. Apparently the report has been submitted and still no action taken. So now we are into the 11th or 12th year after the UN has called us out and still there is no legislation on the block to say that it is an offence for a husband to rape the wife. Ridiculous. So what are we celebrating after 200 years? <laughs> <laughs> we are celebrating that Singapore has become so oppressive and so ridiculous a country. We're the laughing stock of the whole world. Well, I think, I, I think we have to divide Singapore, as in you have a government that's obviously entrenched in the past, I would say. I mean, you, you've had previous government that has been kind of the shiny example for other, especially in the region. Like, wow, look at how Singapore, the trajectory, you know, in the 80s and the 90s, the you know, financial trajectory. But now we have to divide Singapore because when you talk to Singaporean people on the ground, there's some amazing people. People are, are creative. They are, you know, it's easy to go to London and hear someone talk bad about their government. Like, you know, everyone's got an opinion. Every black taxi driver, not the color, you know, the, ta the black taxi cabs, you know, the driver will have his opinion or her opinion on, on the, their politics. But to hear that, like every time I get into a taxi or a grab now, everyone's got an opinion and it's usually not very favorable actually. So to hear them be vocal, I, I always in the back of my mind think, wow, how, how brave, how forward thinking, how, how large people's minds are. Like, you just can't be fed something and think, oh yeah, that's, I saw it on the news, that's correct. So when we talk about Singapore being stuck in the past or not progressing, we're really talking about, so for example, the judiciary who's not, uh, or, well, not really the judiciary, but whoever's in charge of updating laws so that some women can't be raped, you know, just because you have the status of a wife doesn't mean that that's okay for you to be raped. Um, that department hasn't progressed. Um, the, the government... Actually, can I just interject there? It is not uh, the fault of the judiciary because the defamation laws, if you want to change them, because in Singapore we have a defamation act, now, we, have, of course, have the common law principles to supplement that, all right? But if you really want to make significant changes to the defamation laws, it has to be parliament that does it, because it is only parliament that can make laws. That's what happened in England. The House of Commons, and uh, endorsed by the House of Lords, uh, came up with a new defamation act. And one of the main movers of that act uh, was a very famous lawyer, uh, Sir Anthony Lester, who actually has appeared in Singapore courts before. But uh, there's just no will on the part of the Singaporean parliamentarians to do anything like that. And in that regard, we are not progressive. So, so that's actually quite interesting because obviously the government's made up of a lot of people, right? I, I don't know how many hundreds of people are involved in that circle of government. It seems to me, it's actually, when you talk about fear, it's actually those that are fearful, the, the people that could be the, the, the change agents, you know, the agents of change, it, it seems to be that those are the ones that, you know, when I get into a taxi, he's not scared. He, he's quite happy. He doesn't know who I am. He's quite happy to say, this is what I think. When I look at your Facebook page and I see all the thousands and thousands of people who write some pretty hard-hitting and well-thought-out opinions that are, you know, basically anti-government, 
they're not the people that are scared. Um, it seems to be that it is the people that could actually make the changes, could rewrite the policies and update and, and, and pr move Singapore forward with these progressive policies, these, of which they don't have to reinvent the wheel. I mean, there are other nations doing some fantastic... Minimum wage springs to mind, like a living wage. You know, Singapore doesn't have one. It's like one of the last first world countries in the world that refuses, or the marital rape issue. Um, when you talk about fear, do you, is it fair to say you think it's those people that really seem to be the most fearful? Oh, very much so. You know, uh, I think the legislators are fearful. They have allowed party loyalty to override, you know, uh, any notions of national interest. And how refreshing it was last night when we saw the House of Commons defeat the government's uh, proposals for Brexit by a margin of 230 votes, the largest defeat in Commons history. And we just don't have any notion of that in Singapore. And what that does is that fear factor then permeates down to our civil servants who do not dare to question. And I think uh, a very prominent uh, civil servant, Ngam Tong Dao, said it right a few years ago. We have just lost this ability to question. And you know what is the biggest barrier? It's because all our politicians and our civil servants are paid crazy salaries and no one is willing to risk losing that salary. Yeah, Lim Tian is absolutely right. We have lost the ability to question. Why hasn't anybody asked in Parliament? Or why hasn't the media asked a very simple question? When will the government stop making money from the people's CPF and HDB? Simple question. Is it fear? Mm. I don't know. And there is something to be said there, just for anyone listening who doesn't know, the Singaporean, I think the Prime Minister of Singapore is the most highly paid Prime Minister in the whole of the world. And I think he gets, I think if you put the top four, is it the top four leaders? Uh, and he earns as much as that? What, what is it, Lin Tian? Oh, I, 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 couldn't, I couldn't be accurate on that. All I know is that he's paid uh, a package of 2.2 million a year. The next highest paid leader in the world is the Australian Prime Minister at 550,000. So, yes, probably you could add four or five or six leaders to make up to that 2.2 million. And, and of course, the Australian Prime Minister has only got a short gig. <laughs> <laughs> it's just that he's not going to be in for a very long time. He, he governs a nation that has at least eight times the population of, no, not eight times, at least five times the population of Singapore, I would say. Okay. And I am probably the lowest paid blogger <laughs> in history, you know. 20 years, thousands of articles, <laughs> speeches, protests, never got a single cent. <laughs> yeah, there's, there's, there's that too. So it's... it's and I know that riles people. I've read many things online about that. I don't think any Singaporean is proud of that fact about the, the, how much their government actually costs them. It doesn't, it doesn't seem to be like a national treasure. <laughs> it's not something that they put out there. So let's go back to the defamation case. We asked people to ask some questions because there is naturally some confusion. And before we ask the questions, let's talk about that confusion. Though so in Singapore, there is no such thing as a free press either. Uh, you have... Is it... How many newspapers do you have? Well, um, you know, we have the Straits Times, uh, another paper called Today, and then we have the Chinese newspapers. All these are what I brand as state media. They are all under the control of one company, Singapore Press Holdings. Okay? Now, I do not consider them free. I do not consider them uh, impartial. And... Honestly, I don't follow them, but we have over the years had some incredibly uh, good alternative sites spring up. I would name uh, the online citizen as top of my choice. I think Terry Su is doing a fantastic job at TOC. He, has, he was a one-man show for a long time. I think he now has more help. I would like to see him expand his base because he provides good investigative journalism, the type of journalism that any progressive country must aspire to have. And Yahoo News, I think, is great too. 
you know. So I, I, I single out these two in particular, and I hope people support them, and, and people actually turn away from the state media, because they're just propaganda broadsheets. And our press freedom ranking is 151. 151? Gosh, there's only how many countries? 200 and... 70 something. I think the index <laughs> is not even off that. I think the index is probably like off 170 or something. How have state media, I mean, I haven't followed state media. Um, I kind of have a personal uh, affirmation, well, no, a, a pers personal policy not to follow any media that doesn't allow comments. I think if you're not allowing comments, then you are really trying to control the narrative and control the perspective, and it's just one way. So I've noticed wherever, if ever I've gone to Straits Times, they don't have comments. I'm not sure if you're premium subscriber if you do get the comments um, Yahoo has comments TOC the online citizen has comments so Zerhien how have have you followed mainstream media about your case and how have they supported you or not supported you how, how has that gone for you about this particular defamation case you find yourself in uh, in my opinion the reporting on my case uh, has not been very fair uh, the first news that came out about my being sued by the Prime Minister for Defamation was a premium article. A premium article meaning unless you are a subscriber, you can't read the, the article itself. And if you read just the headline of the premium article, it gives the impression that I wrote something on my Facebook and that's why I'm sued for defamation. I mean, actually, you didn't write a thing. You didn't yeah, of course. But of course, if you are a subscriber and you bother to read the article, then of course he says, yeah, I know. He only shared a post without any comment. Mm -hmm. So that, that's a bias, isn't it? That's obvious. Uh, they didn't report the facts. Oh, yeah, but just uh, add on. And subsequently, when I made a clarification, you know, that the reporting was not accurate, the second news report was still uh, unfair because you said something like, uh, but this time it's not a premium article, everybody could read. It said something like, uh, well, Mr. Leong says he did not make any comment, but according to court papers, blah, 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 blah. So mm -hmm. by implication, when you say, but according to court papers, you're again giving the impression unfairly and inaccurately that I wrote something which I didn't. And what did you do about that? Obviously, you read this, did you? Oh, I didn't have to do anything because uh, many people commented on this oh, uh, biasness and the online citizen, among others, actually wrote an article chastising the, the state media, mm -hmm. as Lim Tian uh, calls them, for this uh, inaccurate reporting on my case. But they didn't? make a new post or didn't put it Not right. that I'm uh, way off, yeah. <laughs> just, just hidden it. Okay, so that's where the state media is in, in Singapore. Um, so it's great. How, why do they allow an alternative media? Do they have to have a license or how, how you know, I know you can't speak for the online citizen. There's a few, how, how do they get away with posting an alternative to state media? Do they have to have a license? I'm not very sure about the origins of the alternative sites, you know. All I can say is I admire the people who started them. Um, I think TOC has been around the longest, the online citizen. And I do believe now that TOC actually uh, has to have a license from uh, IMDA. And they even have to put down quite a hefty deposit for that. So they are regulated in, in, in most ways. I do not know the extent, and, and here I stand to be corrected, but in many ways, as if they are a, a, a proper media, like a newspaper. Well, actually, the new uh, media regulations are arguably the most ridiculous in the world. It goes something like, if any website writes about Singapore at least twice or more than twice a month, they can put you under the regulations, meaning uh, you cannot accept foreign funding. Uh, if you are asked to take down undesirable content, you must do it within a certain time. Uh, and this makes it very difficult for alternative media because it strikes fear, 
right, into the hearts of Singaporeans. Just imagine, anyone who writes more than twice about Singapore in a month can be put under these regulations. And this is one of the regulations. The one that Lim Tian mentioned, putting the $15,000 bond is a, is a separate one, you know. But there are so many regulations mm. to arguably curtail the freedom of expression in Singapore. Mm. What a shame. What a shame they can't use it in a, a more positive way, you know. Everybody's a publisher, everyone has an opinion, can have a reach. You can be 17 years old, you know, with a, a reach of thousands and thousands and no, no media license required and uh, that should be a good thing, ultimately, you know. Other nations have seen that be a good thing because it's creativity. If I could just have a short interjection here. I want to come back to the point I will always make, whether I'm a lawyer or I'm a politician. Freedom of speech is fundamental and so important to the progress of life. You know, in the 80s and the 90s, Southeast Asia was under the control of four autocrats. Lee Kuan Yew, Suharto, even Mahathir then was a dictator and autocrat. And, you know, Marcos is the most often cited example. And yes, civil liberties were curtailed then. And the argument was always, no, we are not a Western society. We cannot allow these things because there is social harmony to be preserved. That is always going to be the argument of a dictatorial autocratic government who fears, who fears losing power and only knows how to use fear to control people. After the fall of Suharto, Indonesia became fiercely democratic. If you go to Indonesia today, the press is so free, they can say anything they want. There are people, the young Indonesians, are, I believe, one of the highest users of social media in the world for still a relatively poor country. But today, Indonesia has progressed so much and is well on its way to becoming the fourth largest economy in two decades' time. And, you know, when, when I looked at their stock exchange in the late 90s, it was a miserable 400 points. Today, the stock exchange in Jakarta is over 6,500 points. In contrast, in Singapore, I, I, to the best of my recollection, we were at like 2,000 points in the late 90s. Today, we are at around 3,000. So really, you know, you're trying to tell me that free speech is bad for the improvement, for the development of a country. And you know what? When Suharto fell, all of them said, oh, Indonesia is going to implode. Indonesia is going to disappear. There's going to be chaos. Total nonsense. Like you say, that's the fear, right? If, if this changes, they say this is a thing with the minimum wage. If, if we bring it in, everybody will leave, all the companies will leave, and it's never happened, and that doesn't happen. But when, when, you're, when you're trying to hold on, that's the type of things we expect to hear. You know, we talk about the minimum wage as like it's just two English words. Mm -hmm. But so often when I have friends from overseas, they go to the hawker centre and they say, ah, why is your country like this? Inevitably, the person who comes to clean your table is an elderly man or elderly woman, must be at least older than I am when I'm 65, right? There's no minimum wage. Yeah, yeah. There's still people working for pension, $5 right? plus mm. an hour. Mm. You have 100,000 people earning just more than $1,000 a month. And that's, uh, you know, before you deduct your CPF contribution, right? So. As Lim Tian said, Professor Tommy Ko said recently, uh, we have 150,000 households in abject poverty. Mm -hmm. There's about 500,000 people mm -hmm. who are struggling daily to make ends meet. And this is just the abject poverty numbers. Mm -hmm. What about relative proper poverty? Mm -hmm. Probably looking at another 200,000 households. Mm -hmm. 
Yep, there's a lot for you to sort out as a politician here. <laughs> oh, I'm <laughs> glad I'm not a politician. <laughs> you you have your hands full, uh, Olympia. <laughs> <laughs> well, he does now. He has your case also. So, Right, so we had some questions coming from the public. Um, this first question I'm going to read out from Jerry because he, so many other people have brought up this word and I really would like you to address it, Lim Tian. Um, hi, Mr. Lim, do Sing does Singapore have a law that can impeach the PM if in the eyes of the citizens, the PM or the government has misused the process of the law. Lots of people have brought up this word, impeach. Um, Jerry, thank you for asking that question. I know impeachment is a subject that fascinates people now because of what's happening in America and the constant talk of the impeachment of Trump. Now, impeachment is a feature in the American Constitution. And presidents there can be impeached by Congress meaning the House of Representatives can move the motion, and then he stands trial in the Senate. And if two-thirds of the Senate finds him guilty, he can be removed from office. We don't have a similar concept in Singapore. I don't think that we have this concept of impeachment in the Constitution. What happens in our country, and we follow the Westminster model, is that the Prime Minister is someone who commands the confidence of Parliament i.e. he commands more than 50% of parliament. Now, if parliament loses confidence in him, if his own party, the PAP, loses confidence in him, they then have their own internal mechanism to remove him as party leader. So I think that's how it works in Singapore. Okay, thank you for that. Um, Ken C, this is for you, uh, Zahian. Uh, he says... I believe that I read Mr. Leong did offer a sum for compensation as requested by the plaintiff. However, the sum was deemed as derogatory. Was this true? And if so, I believe people would be keen to know how the plaintiff viewed that sum offered as derogatory. And was there a suggested respectable amount offered to the accused to pay as compensation? Uh, this is not true. Fake I news. think he got, uh, <laughs> he got confused with the Roy Nung case right. in 2014 when Roy uh, apologized. And uh, since uh, no compensation amount was given to him in the letter of demand, he was asked to offer an amount. So he offered an amount of $5,000 with his apology. And I uh, understand it was taken against him that he had apologized. And uh, his case at the summary judgment did not go to trial. So in my case... Uh, I did not apologize. So that was fake news, Kenzie. So, um, okay, thank you for clarifying that. He also asks about the sharing of the post, how many times it was shared, and um, has, has, the, has, so, has there been any indication so far from the plaintiff as to reasons why, uh, despite numerous sharing of the article, that only Zahian, has there been any in any of the, the, the case filings? None at all. And I think that must be the question most Singaporeans are asking, why has Zihian been the only one targeted, singled out? When, as we know, or from some unofficial sources, 9,900 people shared that post. So, you know. Okay, um, from Edwin Fong, uh, to Zahian, assuming Zahian wins the case, would the case take precedence and open up opportunities for other Singaporeans who have been sued, bankrupted, imprisoned, homes raided and possessions confiscated to launch a class action suit against the PM? No, it, it wouldn't happen like that. Every case is different and, uh, uh, you know, uh, so I can safely say that this case will stand on its own. But I think this is a very important case, arguably the most important legal case uh, in uh, recent memory. And um, I, I, I think it, it, it is going to set a real example for our social conduct in the decades to come, in how politicians relate to the citizenry and how the citizenry see politicians. Yeah, I may just add to that. Uh, on my 65th birthday uh, in November, as usual, you make a birthday wish, right? <laughs> and it's supposed to be secret, but anyway, <laughs> it just came to my mind. I might as well tell you what was my birthday wish. My birthday wish was mm -hmm. that no one 
will ever have to fear being sued by a politician for exercising the rights to freedom of expression again, ever. Wow, that's very nice for you to share with everybody else. Well, it's a <laughs> birthday wish that is uh, filled with self-interest, <laughs> would you say? <laughs> that's very nice. Uh, and I, and I s it seems to be that way when I, uh, I speak to people about this or what I read online, and we spoke before, that you've become this uh, face of something much larger. It's very much become against the people versus the PM, really. Which is why then I asked about what we think maybe the Prime Minister is thinking, because sure he wouldn't want, to, want it for that to have happened, but by taking these like almost punitive measures, it, 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 it feels that way, and definitely people looking in are, are having that persp same perspective. So, yeah, maybe, the, well, who knew that when you reach 65 that you would be the poster boy, you are. <laughs> <laughs> the, the face of this uh, campaign. Okay, we've got someone else. Um, some of these are not anonymous. Uh, obviously, in the climate of Singapore, a lot of people don't want to have their names read out. So this one's anonymous. Um, <laughs> is it true that the government is attempting to purchase championship belts for ministers in parliament to show that they are champions and stewards of the nation? <laughs> and this has been circulating in the SSC WhatsApp. And is this a good use of the money? <laughs> <laughs> now, I have absolutely no idea whether they are using or they are purchasing championship belts for their ministers or politicians. So I can't be of any help in that regard, you know. But um, I would imagine, uh, I would say this, the state media talks them up all the time and at the same time denigrates opposition politicians, uses every opportunity to smear them, to denigrate them. Um, so... Yeah, um, maybe they don't buy championship belts, but you know they have other methods of uh, propping up uh, their image and their ego. But you know what? All this is going to come to naught because the internet age is upon us. And a few years ago, a Chinese uh, person told me, you know, in this internet age, there cannot be any corrupt government. All right. you, you cannot have any government that tries to, to impose its will, to, 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 to put fear into people. You look at China, a country not particularly well known for freedom of expression. And yet today in China, when there's an incident in any small town, you have millions of people commenting on social media. So we are in that age now, I'm afraid. And you know what? the state media is going to become less and less relevant. It's going to become a dinosaur, it's going to die off. And social media, the alternative sites, are the way forward. I have no idea what he's talking about. <laughs> I'm 65. What, what are championship belts? In, in boxing, right? <laughs> I think in boxing, the oh, belt in boxing, you wear. Okay. Yeah. Right. But hey, this is free speech and the question came in. So okay. yeah. free to, right. free to discuss that. Ask anything under the sun. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Um, okay, this is a very interesting one because you're both advocates of free speech and somebody has written in to say it would be interesting to know if he, and I'm assuming that's you, Zahian, would sue a newspaper vendor too if you had been unhappy with the report published and reported on by that newspaper. Would no, you sue? I mean, free speech is about different opinions, the right to express whatever you want, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. So if the day comes when people, did you say, sue the newspaper? Mm. When people start doing that, I think that will be a big step backwards, you know, for mm -hmm. freedom of expression. Yes, yes. And actually going back to the boxing uh, analogy with the championship belts, you have to be able to take a hit. I mean, both of you, I'm sure you've written articles. You said you've written thousands of articles in your life, none of which yeah, have fallen far as, of defamation. As a writer, what I love most would be comments that criticize what yeah, I say. challenge you. Otherwise, then the, nobody bothers about what you're saying. Mm, that's true. Okay, we're going to end the questions on this one. It's rather uh, legal, so I'll address it to Lim Tien. Um, it says, Lee Sin Lung abusing process, using his power and influence. Can you sue on this? Which actually you are counter-suing on abuse of process, right? Um, opinion. He is LHL. Oh, sorry. So Lee Sin Lung, def by definition, he cannot abuse his power because his power has no limits. The point of defamation is to vindicate a person's reputation. And if he suffered loss to his reputation as a result of some falsehood, then 
in principle, he should be entitled to recover. The problem with the way defamation law in Singapore is constructed is that politicians are regarded as having reputations that are far more valuable than any of their global counterparts. So any criticism that cannot be proved as true is considered to damage their reputation. The position is inherently absurd because there is no observable reason to believe a politician's reputation is any more or less valuable than any other class of person. And while it is certainly more important to a politician than, say, a hawker, there is no basis to assert that just because someone is well known, this someone has an outstanding reputation and that that is worth a great deal of money and that a piece of libel has destroyed his reputation. Or simply, it's quite hard to measure the damage, if any at all, a piece of libel has on a person's reputation, unless the person's reputation is completely destroyed. I think it's a very important question. Um, what do you think, Lim Tian? I think that is a very interesting question. I think it is a very interesting comment. I think it is a valid comment. Just because you are the Prime Minister doesn't mean that you will necessarily have a sterling reputation. And it was funny when I read the uh, Prime Minister's statement of claim, the opening paragraph was, the plaintiff is the Prime Minister of Singapore. Yeah, well, yeah, that is a fact. It is his office. And uh, what I will disagree with in that comment is that uh, the opening lines were that he cannot abuse his position. Or that is completely untrue. And I, I, my favorite example is to take people back to the time when Charles I, the king of England, was beheaded. And there it happened for the very first time in English history. And the president said was that the king is not a person. The king is an office. So Lee Hsien Loong now occupies the office of the prime minister. That is all. And I ask people to remember that. And um, I hope I've answered that adequately. And I am just an ordinary senior citizen. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so is that, was that on his, you know, Leong Zhe Hien, he didn't put his office, just an ordinary Singapore citizen. And I think actually, though, we just made a joke of that, but the idea that you are, you know, the fact that you are an ordinary Singaporean citizen, it has, everybody has done what you have done. Everybody has shared a post. Everybody has um, expressed themselves online. Everybody. I mean, whether you are, it doesn't matter the age, it doesn't matter what about. Every, and usually the, the, the posts that people share, that we share, are our opinions. I like this, I don't like this. And that's how we are, you know, navigating through the huge amounts of information that we're receiving on a daily basis. Um, and we're telling our friends and groups and networks, this is good, this is bad, this is, you know, this is who I am. It's an expression. These types types of conversations that used to take place you know, uh, in the workplace, um, in the, the uh, at dinner, in the shopping, you know, after work or something like that. We don't have that same kind of social um, pattern anymore. And really, our expressions are more and more online. You know, we, we send out something. So it's, it's really important because what you have done is so ordinary. You know, like when you had the case of Amos Yee, yeah, he was extraordinary. Like what he was doing, nobody was doing. And he was a beacon of, oh my God, talk about push it to the limits. But what you've done, Zerhien, is something that every single person has done. So I think that's why the limelight is on you. I think that's why these organizations are looking at you and these activists and people who are looking for free speech change in all over the world are looking at you because what you've done is not, it wasn't very activist of you. <laughs> I mean, you'd make the worst activi activist ever in like England or <laughs> America. You know, as a Singaporean, you just shared a post. Um, so I think that that's really important as an ordinary person. Um, so we're going to move towards the end now. What can people do? I mean, uh, you obviously have not said, okay, I'll be sued, I'll shut up, I'll, I'll comply. I, you've said, no, you know what, I'll take this to the nth degree. However long it's going to take to run, whether I'm going to Hong Kong and giving an article, uh, 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 an interview over in England, you know, amnesty. Um, <coughs> So what can the ordinary person do? Because the ordinary person, we just had these questions come in and half of them wanted to remain anonymous. That's actually quite a, a good little um, symbol of what's going on. So people want to remain anonymous, but they do support you. What have you got planned? What can, what can people do? Well, um, yes. Um, I am organizing a rally on the 26th of January at Hong Lim Park on 
the theme of abuse of process. I hope many, many Singaporeans will turn up there. And Singaporeans, this is an important moment in our nation's history. If we are to believe in progress, in free speech, this is the time to show up. It's no use, you know, just being keyboard warriors, typing away furiously. Sometimes, you know, you have to show the numbers to make the impact. And I would urge you to turn up. And the second thing you can do, Singaporeans, is I ask you all to donate generously to Zihian's Defense Fund. This is going to be a long, tough struggle, and I promise you that. This is not going to be, the Prime Minister is not going to steamroll over Leong Zihian in this case. We may suffer setbacks at some point in time during the litigation. We are going to go all the way, and if necessary, we are going to appeal to the highest court in the land. Now, my answer to your question is, like other ordinary Singaporeans, I'm just defending myself, and I take the wise counsel of my leader counsel. Kim Tian. <laughs> okay, and let's talk money then, because, of course, the, so who, who's paying for the Prime Minister? Does he have to pay for himself, or does he get that paid for? Well, he's a personal litigant, so theoretically he has to pay it himself. Do you think he gets mates' rates? <laughs> <laughs> well, then you have to ask his lawyer, Davinder Singh. <laughs> and, and which which company? Which He's from a very big firm that I used to be uh, with in the nineties. He's from a firm called Drew and Napier. And I guess they're expensive. Very expensive lawyers. Okay, yes. so they're expensive. So, um, so but the prime minister should be paying for this himself, or Drew and Napier. Um, but of course, you have this also this issue that the prime minister is the highest paid. Prime Minister in the world. Um, and I don't know what his hourly salary works. So, so even if he takes like a 20-minute a conference call in the middle of a Tuesday afternoon from Drew and Napier, it's actually costing the taxpayer <laughs> a little bit of, and, and on his salary, that's just quite a lot of money. <laughs> He'd have to be putting in the hours after, after hours to make it up. <laughs> yes, quite right. Okay, so from your side, you're, you're, you're raising this money because in the event that you lose, there's some massive costs involved. I mean, Singapore litigation is costly, right? Can you, can you talk us through some numbers? Like, what are you looking at? Oh, we would be looking at hundreds of thousands of dollars, all right, for, for a claim of this nature, the profile, you know, and I, I, I do not know what the damages are going to be. It is up to the judge to assess. That is on the, uh, you, you, you know, I, I mean on the hypothetical that, Zihian loses, and I'm telling you, I'm not fighting this case to lose, all right? Um, in fact, um, I, I look forward to Zihian having his day in court and to us uh, being able to cross-examine the Prime Minister effectively. I think we want the truth to emerge in court, and um, that, that is all we can ask for. Yeah, so I think as ordinary Singaporeans, you, you know, some of you wrote in a, a, a letter and asked it to be anonymous. Um, so if you can donate, you can donate anonymously too. This is not for a political cause, right? So you can donate. It, it doesn't have to be logged anywhere. It's not like donating to a political party where you have to register your amount. You don't have to. You can donate anonymously. You can put power behind this even without your name being there. Even if you're, you're too fearful to come to Speaker's Corner, Hong Lim Park, for the rally, um, there'll be many, many people there. Many people aren't. I think more and more people every day are like, you know what? Uh, I'm, uh, this is who I am. These are my beliefs. You, you see that on social media so much. But if you are one of those that really, I don't have social media, I, I, I do not want to be uh, my name out there, you can donate. There's lots of ways uh, on Zerhian's channels and, and Limtian's to, uh, you know, via PayPal, GoFundMe bank transfer, whatever. It doesn't have to be registered. No one's looking. Um, so that's one way for ordinary Singaporeans to support another ordinary Singaporean and then have this impact going forward. Um, so everybody who's listening, if you are considering doing that, then I think I hope after listening to this podcast of how these two 
men are both standing up for every single person in Singapore, whether you're watching, listening to this or not, um, and get involved in some way. If you are brave enough to show your face, get down to Hong Lim Park on the 26th of January and show your face to support and listen to some speakers talking about free speech, talking about um, how that's good for the economy, good for futures, good for jobs. Um, and if you're not that person, uh, that you can always tune in online. I know the online citizen always live streams the event and you, uh, you can watch online in the safety of your own home so you can't be seen. And donate, make a, consider making a donation. Even just $10 will make a huge, when, when all these people rally together, make a huge impact um, and, and show the prime minister. It's really not, it's not about destroying the prime minister, is it? It's about showing that, hey, listen, listen to where the world is, where Singaporeans are, what Singaporeans want. And it's, and it's a very reasonable request. You know, it's not an Amos Yi. It's not, hey, we want to be able to, you know, cause havoc or to riot or protest or strike it's it's about sharing a Facebook post and I think I don't think anyone listening the PAP IBs you call them the in what is it what does IB stand for internet brigade yeah, the internet brigade I can't even think how they might craft that Zahiem was completely unreasonable and he deserves everything he gets and I think you also have a, a colloquial term here that you have in your lexicon which is uh, is it sue your pants off or yes sue your pants <laughs> off I don't think anybody listening or anybody who really understands the case um, can think that you deserve that because there's just nothing here to say that. So, Zahien, um, some last words from you. Well, I want to thank all the IBs <laughs> for all the criticism <laughs> that you have been throwing at me. Uh, it makes the discussion more interesting. I want to take this opportunity to thank the thousands of people who have sent me messages of support. Mm -hmm. you know, I'm so grateful. Uh, many of these messages are so touching. Mm -hmm. uh, every other day, I'm in tears. That's everything. And MTM. Uh, um, I would say this in closing. This to me is one of the seminal moments in our nation's history. And this arguably is the most important legal case that has emerged since we became an independent country. And I am not blowing my own trumpet or I am not playing up the significance of it. It is that important. That every country will have certain important legal uh, cases. In America, everyone talks about Roe v. Wade, about abortion. In Singapore, we have always had this fear of speaking freely because of what the consequences are. And I ask you to remember that because this case challenges that fear. And if we are able to break that fear, we emerge a stronger, better country. Thank you, Lim Tian. You're rather a good speaker. You should be a politician or something. Oh. <laughs> so actually, so yeah, Roe v. Wade. So this would be Leong v. Lee. Is that correct? This would be uh, Lee Sien Long versus Leong Zihian. Yes. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for your time to sit here and delve into it. And I think it's really important to... The, we heard some fake news. You put it straight. We got the timeline out and uh, explored, explored the subject. So thank you very much and good night. Thank you. Yeah, thank you.